Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on this Friday evening for our webinar. We'll discuss IUI and donor sperm. And I would like to first of all introduce you to this evening's panels. That is going to be Dr. Kita Benkat and then myself and our head of donation, which is Mrs. Darshi Karuba and Mrs. Bijal Gill, who's one of our patient coordinators. So this evening's agenda, we will first of all discuss IUI as a treatment, and then we will look at choosing a donor. Then we will also discuss some of the aspects around donor anonymity and legal parenthood and some frequently asked questions and the role of counselling. And then lastly, we'll point you towards some further resources and practical steps towards this treatment. And I'd like to hand over to Dr. Venkat. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening, and uh, thank you, Sveth. IUI, is, it's also called artificial insemination. Basically, it involves um, placing the prepared sperm inside the uterus and so that the sperm is able to go to the tube and catch the eggs and fertilize the eggs. This is more natural, more simple, and it's not very expensive. Therefore, this is uh, couple, uh, preferred by a lot of couples and also in young women, it has got a good success rate. So that's why, and then if you want to see what are the clinical indications, we say couples with mild male factor, when the sperm count is slightly on the lower side or borderline, then we say it's a good idea to prepare the sperm, take all the fast moving sperm and put this in, put the sperm preparation in the uterus to increase the chances. And single women who need donor inseminations, uh, similarly same sex couples, lesbian couples who need insemination. And there is, uh, when there is some mild endometriosis, this treatment is helpful. And also couples who, the other important thing is couples who have struggled to have intercourse. That means this condition is called vaginismus, where there is uh, no problem with the vagina anatomically. However, it's sort of a psychological issue and they find it very difficult to have sexual intercourse. And similarly, if men have some erectile dysfunction or ejaculation issues, then this treatment will be successful. In these couples, the success rate is very good because there is no real infertility issue. Okay, so how do we perform this uh, treatment? This can be done on a natural cycle because in some couples, like I said, who cannot have sex, it's not a medical issue, therefore they can go with the natural cycle. Normally women produce, start growing few eggs, but finally only one dominant follicle and the egg continues to grow and release the egg, which is called the ovulation. So at that time, we'll prepare the sperm and place it in the uterus. So that is called natural cycle. And if some people want to increase the success rate, where we give some medications such as clomiphene citrate or letrozole to induce ovulation. And women who are over 38 years, this will also increase the chances of success because clomid and letrozole can make women produce one or two follicles, then it increases the success rate in such women. Therefore, it's useful for older women. And also even in young women, if they want to increase their chances, then you can use the medicated cycle. The only thing we must remember with medicated cycle is the risk of multiple pregnancy, especially if somebody has two or three follicles, there is a risk. And that's why we should be aware of that. If you want to avoid the risk of multiple pregnancy, then it is better to go for natural cycle. And in both the methods, we do perform ultrasound scans, especially if someone is going for medicated cycle, it is not advisable to do the treatment without scan monitoring. So we perform it. And even in natural cycle, to time the insemination properly, it is better to do the scan monitoring. And once we know when the follicle is good, there are two ways of doing it. People can start testing for ovulation with various methods. Now they have all these uh, fertility indicators, which will show the time of ovulation. They can use that. Or we can also give an injection to release, make the woman release the egg. 
that is called the trigger injection, which will trigger ovulation. And we can give that. This will help us to time the insemination much better, especially if some clinics are not performing IUI over the weekend. This will be helpful, and we can give the trigger and perform the insemination and avoid the weekend under these circumstances. Now, IUI is a very simple treatment and easy for the patients, but the most important thing is the success rate. What is the success rate? It's not very high compared to IVF. Having said that, why should we compare it with IVF? IVF is totally different treatment. We are not comparing apples with apples. So that is not the way to compare it. The success rate, of course, varies with so many factors from age, number of eggs, quality of the eggs, and other things. So that, that's why in this slide you can see that it is written as 5 to 25 percent. It's a big range, and that is because it depends on the age. Supposing we do in IUI in women, say, in their early 30s, the success rate will be something like 20 percent. But if the same procedure is performed in a woman who is 40 years old, it's going to be 5 to 10 percent. And another important thing we must remember about IUI is this treatment can be performed only if the fallopian tubes are open, okay? Supposing the tubes are blocked, there is no way this treatment will work because if, if we put the sperm inside the uterus, if the tubes are blocked, there is no way the sperm and the egg can meet because the sperm will be in the uterus, the tubes are blocked, and the egg is on the other side of water, like we say. Therefore, it's like UK and America, you know, USA, they cannot meet and no point in doing this treatment. So first essential investigation we have to do is check the fallopian tube for this treatment. Okay, so I talked about this natural versus medicated cycle, but then how do we monitor it and when do we perform it? What are the steps of the treatment? So usually we bring the patients for a scan in the beginning of the cycle, something like day two to day four, to see what is happening. This baseline scan is important. Some people think, oh, I don't need, I had a scan and it was all right uh, three months ago. Sometimes women can have cyst formation in the ovaries. If there is a cyst in the beginning of the cycle, then when you come for the mid-cycle scan, it can be mistaken as a follicle and the IUI performed at the wrong time. And therefore, we must make sure we do the scan, the initial phase that is day two to day four to exclude any cysts in the ovaries. Then we bring the patient for this next scan around day 10. Of course, if the woman is going to do natural cycle, she doesn't take any medication. If she's going to use medicines, then it will be either clomiphene or letrozole starting from the second day to the sixth day of the cycle. It's the medications or the tablets are only for five days. Then we scan them around day 10 to see what's going on. Why is there a follicle developing? Is it one follicle or two follicle? And how big is the follicle? That's very important. In some women, the follicle may already be around 18 and they are likely to ovulate around day 12. Whereas in some women, the follicle will be only around 15 or 16. That means they are going to ovulate after a few days. So depending on the size of the follicle, we decide whether the woman needs another scan. And when the follicle reaches a size of around 18 to 20, then we discuss with them whether they want to go for natural ovulation. That means checking for the LH surge, or if they would like to have the trigger injection, we give them the HCG injection to induce ovulation and then do the insemination on that day. So if we give the trigger injection today, we can perform the insemination tomorrow after 24 to 30 hours in between the time, or we can also perform at 36 hours. Say we give it tonight, and then we do the insemination day after tomorrow. Just like doing the egg collection in IVF, we do the insemination at 36 hours. So that is the other way of doing it. And medicatory cycle, I told you already, taking the tablets for five days, and then, of course, with medicator cycle, we give the trigger injection because we don't want to take any chances in case the eggs are not released from the follicle, then the chance of success is not very high. So we give the trigger injection. 
And if we give trigger injection, sometimes we also think it's a good idea to give progesterone supplementation in the second half of the cycle or the luteal phase. This is particularly important with the Clomiphene tablet because it has got a side effect of thinning the lining of the womb. Sometimes the line endometrium may not become very thick for the insemination, which will then reduce the success rate. So then we have to give estrogen tablets to thicken the lining of the womb. If we give estrogen tablets, then it is better to give some progesterone suppositories in the luteal phase of the second half after the IUI so that the pregnancy will be supported with the estrogen as well as the progesterone. Okay, so we discussed about the, I mean, methods of natural cycle and medicated cycle. What are the pros and cons? Now, if you look at it, as I said, natural cycle is more natural, like no interference with nature, no medications and no other, we are not interfering. But at the same time, it's less controlled because we have to go with the natural ovulation and the less certainty, like we don't know exactly when ovulation is happening. And if the clinics are not open over the weekend, that can be a problem. And because of this the timing issue, there is slightly lower chance of success. But with medicator cycle, we are able to control things better. And we also, with the tablets like the clobifene or letrozole, Women produce more than one egg, that increases the chances. And also we are, we are giving the trigger injection to time the procedure better or the time the ovulation procedure better. And if you also give supplementary estrogen and progesterone, the whole hormone, uh, hormonal environment is better for the pregnancy. But only one thing we will remember about this medicator cycle is the risk of multiple pregnancy. And for both the treatments, as I told you before, we must have patent fallopian tubes. If the tubes are blocked, no way this treatment will work. You must remember that. Okay, now it's come to choosing a donor. I'm going to pass it over to Subir, who is good at talking about this subject. Subir? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Minka. So choosing a donor. So you can use a known donor or an anonymous donor. The choice is yours. Some people, you know, there's pros and cons to both. But in this, we're mainly going to discuss anonymous donors in this topic. But if you wish to find out more about known donors, please do contact our team after the webinar. So anonymous donors, we, there's quite a few options. The first, which is we're, we're quite excited about, which is we finally sort of digitized our catalog of sperm donors and we're starting small. So we're, launch, we're officially launching Harley Street Sperm Bank, which is our online catalog of donor sperm that we have frozen at the clinic. And it's you know ready to use for any of you who wish to use treatment. But it's quite a small catalog at present. We're working on building it up and over time it will grow. In the interim, there are other options, both in the UK and further abroad. So in the UK, we work well with London Sperm Bank and Samovo. Their websites are shown on the slide. And similarly, further afield, um, Zytex in the USA is a very large sperm bank that we've worked with for many years. And similarly, the European Sperm Bank and Cryos over in Denmark. If you are looking to use a donor from further afield, so abroad, the rules around donation vary from country to country. So when you import donor sperm to use in our clinic or any other UK clinic, they need to comply with UK laws on sperm donation. So when you choose a donor from abroad, it's important that you choose a donor that is marked as UK compliant. So as I mentioned, we're launching this. The website for our sperm bank is hssb.uk. So it's nice and short, um, but there's a small catalog on there, and we hope to grow it. So what, does, what are the requirements to be a sperm donor? What are we checking when we accept someone who comes forward to donate sperm? So they should be aged between 18 and 45. There shouldn't be any significant medical history. What do we mean by significant medical history? Well, there shouldn't be any major inheritable or transmissible diseases. Um, and they shouldn't have any major trauma in their lives. They should be a non-smoker, they should be fit and healthy, 
and um, they should have a BMI that's ideally between 20 and 30, so you know, they should have good weight. Um, we do check also carbon monoxide readings for donors to make sure that they don't smoke. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there should be no personal or family history of inheritable diseases. There should be no history of any mental illness. And the sperm parameters, so the very first thing we do with all donors is we check their sperm to make sure that the sperm is of good quality and there's plenty of it and it swims well. And they should have no history of infectious diseases that may be passed on. And then when you look on donor banks, they'll usually have a plethora of acronyms and samples and all kinds of things. Um, so how do you choose the right kind of samples when you're presented with a range of options? Um, so you'll be presented with washed and unwashed samples, typically. Um, unwashed samples are perfectly fine because we always prepare them in the laboratory before, before uh, performing an IUI. Um, washed samples, if you are curious, are typically used for home insemination, which we tend not to advocate, um, but that's a separate discussion altogether. We always advise patients, even for a single treatment, to order at least two ampules or vials. Um, this is because you never know how a vial of sperm will thaw out. And there might be um, a lemon as such. There might be one ampule that doesn't thaw well. And on that day, if this happens and there's no sperm that's, or the sperm's not suitable, then you would essentially have wasted that whole treatment cycle. So it's better that we have a backup. You might not need it in most cases, um, but it should be there just in case because you can't transport the sperm on the day, unfortunately. You should choose sperm that is marked as suitable for IUI, intrauterine insemination, or intracervical insemination, which is marked as ICI. And you can always consider purchasing or reserving further samples if you're thinking of having siblings in due course. And all that's very good, but what should you really look for? Because, you know, if um, particularly if you look at the um, American or international sperm banks, the donor profiles are very extensive. You'll get whole family history and what their aunts and uncles did and everything and all their interests. And all that's great. But what you really want out of this treatment is to have a healthy baby. So, you know, the number one factor I would say to look for is proven fertility. So has the donor um, produced any children previously or, you know, have, has their sperm made any pregnancies before? Um, and so that's what we call proven fertility. And that's sort of number one to look for, because then you can be quite hopeful that their treatment, you know, treatment with that donor will be successful. If someone hasn't had a previous pregnancy, the sperm might look great and all things might, you know, be aligned, but might not result in a pregnancy. And it will always leave us wondering, was that the best choice? Georgia, if I could have the next slide, please. And so at this point, I'd like to hand over to Darshi, who's going to talk a little bit about donor anonymity and the specifics of donation in the UK. Thank you, Darshi. Thank you, Sevilla. Um, good evening, everyone. So I'm here going to talk about donor anonymity. So importantly, when you say any kind of donation, the first question comes in mind is, OK, how can I choose a donor? What is the donor, which Sevilla spoke about? The next question is, will the donor find out about who's the child? And can I find out who is the donor? Can you see the picture? So all these loads of loads of questions you have. So if the child who's born by the donation in the UK, right to learn about the identity of the donor when the child turned into 18. So when the child turned into 18, HFEA is a government body regulator. So the child can approach the HFEA to find out this information. And the other thing is the child born from the donation may also request identifying information about the donor conceived genetical siblings or mutual upon the mutual concerns. And also this is again from the age of 18. So now here is the question for the parents that, oh, do I have to tell the child? 
and if I have to share the child or can I be, I don't want to be anyone to find about um, who's the child from and everything. Again, this whole decision is all about the parents. So you are, have to decide whether are you going to tell the child, are you being openness with the child or not, it's up to you. However, at the practice, it's always, always we suggest that's the best practice to tell the child. Um, there's so many ways it helps. So, and then it's also about what age you can tell the child and what is the right time, right age, and so many questions you may have. So these are the other questions that, yes, I want to be open, but when I ha can be open. So these are the things we can, all these things we will discuss in the counseling as well. And um, Georgia, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, now the donors. So let's say you have find out the donor. Okay, this is the child, your find, child went and found the donor. Do the child have any rights on the, um, do the donor have any rights on the child? Which is, you know, because the only thing the child is, is a legally, like this is a, there's no obligations for the donor or the, the child have anything on the donor or donor have anything on the child. There's no legal bondings or nothing. The only thing is it's a genetical, chromosome um, so we got the sperm so we genetically this is a sperm donor and that's it and uh, but this is slightly different if we are, because some most of the time people use non-sperm donor so those these legal are different because legally anyway it's not but if the child knows you and everything then how you deal with it that's a different question okay Now, implication counseling. So is it, most of the couple ask, why do I have to have the implication counseling? So it's a legal bonding. They say that it's better to understand because you are having a, going through the donation. Number one, you need to be prepared yourself to accept the donation. And the other thing is, you may have so many thousands of questions like I mentioned. So how, how the, the counselor will be answering those questions or help you to find the answer or help you to choose the right decision, how we can do from here. Because it's in pro, it's a complex treatment because you are a couple and there's a third person. So how we deal with it emotionally, everything, we need to be prepared so you will go through the counseling. And it's like, can be uh, as a couple or even single, single mother, it doesn't matter, but you will still go through the counseling. Georgia, can I have the next slide? Now, um, the counseling. So what are the things they have to go through in the counseling? So like I mentioned, if you have any concerns and let's say you had um, some grief that you need to, or there's a fear that you, I don't want to use a donor about because all these questions and so many things, because it's a big decision you're taking for your lifelong decision. So they have so many questions you may have. So that's why the counseling, the implication will help you to support and understand what is involved. And it is to also to en ensure the implication of the treatment, it's in the slides, and provide the opportunity to have the non-clinical questions because the doctor will go through the questions and we also help you during the, this thing. And also when you're choosing a donor uh, from the bank also, you will have all these things, however, as a non-clinical support system, you will go through the counseling so that they can explain all these things to you. And also this may, will be really understanding a little bit more so that it's, it's the whole process is very nice and smooth. Um, can I have the next slides? Um, okay, uh, now I hand over to Dr. Venkat. Now, we are going to go through these FAQs. These are all interesting questions. I'm sure they will be very useful to you. So the first question, will a donor be held responsible if the child is born disabled? Okay, this is a very important question because when we start treatment, we don't think about all the negative things. And if something happens, then we want to know all the facts about it. Therefore, here, we should inform the donor that in case he has got a disease, and he, has, he is aware of the disease, but he has failed to disclose 
then he can be held responsible. Suppose he has got a chromosomal abnormality, which he was not aware of, and we find out then it is not his responsibility. Or sometimes it may not be detected, and it may be detected only in the child for the first time, in which case we cannot hold him responsible. If he has a disease and he has known about it and he has failed to disclose it, only then he's responsible. We can make the donor responsible for that. The next question, can donors change their mind? Yes. This is a lot of, uh, this poses a lot of difficulty to all the clinics. I'm sure you might have experienced that, but this is more applicable in egg donation. But here, um, in sperm donors also, once we use the um, sperm for the treatment, say for example, in IUI, it is simple, we prepare the sperm and we use it. It's not a major problem. However, in IVF treatment, what happens, we use the sperm to fertilize the egg, and after fertilizing, we create the embryos, we transfer one embryo, and supposing we have other good embryos, surplus embryos, we freeze all those embryos and keep them. Say the first treatment is successful and you have a baby. There are, there are some surplus embryos in the freezer. After two years, you want to come back and then have another baby. At that stage, the donor might say, look, I changed my mind now. My, I got married. My wife doesn't want uh, me to use this uh, be an egg, uh, sperm donor, so I'm going to withdraw the consent. So until the embryo is transferred, he has a right to withdraw the consent which is sad, especially for people who are prepared for the treatment. And if they withdraw in the last minute, it is a problem. This is more, uh, more of a problem, Dashi will tell you, because she's uh, dealing with sperm donation as well as egg donation. In egg donation cases, because we uh, prepare the recipient, we match the donor and we prepare the donor. Donor is having all the hormone injection. Just before a collection day, just send a quick email. Oh, you know, I have second thoughts about it. I've changed my mind. I'm not, I will not come for a, a collection procedure, which is awful. But at the same time, they have a right to withdraw their consent till the embryos are transferred. So we have to accept it. In a way, it is good rather than, you know, donating and later on regretting about it. At least they made a decision at this stage. But it causes a lot of practical inconvenience, especially for the recipients, because when they have prepared themselves for the a treatment. Anyway, I'm just moving on from sperm donor to egg donation, which I should not do. Now, uh, next question. How many times can a person donate? So this is an important one. The donor can donate until 10 families are formed, created. Okay. 10 family unit is not 10 children. We must remember that. Each family can have one child, two children, three. It can vary. Therefore, so they are allowed to create up to 10 family units so that they can donate. So we usually restrict at the eight family limit in case they have donated somewhere else just to play it safe and make sure that uh, we don't exceed the 10 family limit. This is the regulation uh, given by the our regulator, Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. Georgia, can I have the next slide, please? So now, once uh, you have the treatment, you must be, you may be wondering, what are the things the donors are allowed to find out about the treatment? The donors are allowed to know if we have used their sperm in the treatment and whether it has, the treatment has been successful. So that is the outcome. And the number of children born from their donation and sex of the children and year of birth. These are the information we can tell the donors, both the sperm donor and egg donors. And so that is the number of children and sex and the year of birth. That's all we can give. Next question they frequently ask is, can a, can a donor be paid? Originally, the donors were not paid at all. You know, when I started my career, we, I remember the donors had to bring all the receipts of their train journey, bus journey. If they had some lunch on the way, they had to bring the receipt of their sandwich and everything. So we used to 
refund the money which they spent for coming to the clinic and you know producing the sperm and everything but now the hfa have changed their policy regarding egg donors and sperm donors the sperm donors are paid 35 pounds per visit and uh, usually they make something like 10 to 15 visits in one course of donation so they get something like 350 to 500 pounds not more than that considering what they do and give people gift of life this is not a big amount i think um then do you have a lot of donor yes yes and no i would say you know sometimes we get donors sometimes we don't get donors and there is always the shortage of the ethnic minority donors um, in our clinic we are lucky to have ethnic minority egg donors and we also have one asian sperm donor but generally uh, all the sperm banks have shortage of this i know some sperm banks sell the afro caribbean and uh, asian the sperm do the donor sperm at a higher price because of the shortage but we don't do anything like that all the donor prices the sperm are the same price in our clinic and but we are trying to increase the donation we do it mainly by word of mouth and sometimes uh, patients friends come and donate but if you know anybody i would say please pass the word on thank you and georgia could you please um, give me the next slide next for the resources so i'm going to pass it on to my colleague vijal vijal can you take over please Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bijal Gill, and I'm a patient coordinator. I may have spoken to some of you already, and if I haven't, I'm sure I will at some point in your journey with us. Using don donor sperm uh, for treatment is a big decision, and I'm sure that some of you have been thinking about this for a long time before you've got in touch with us. It's natural to have questions, and that's what our team is here for, to help and support you. Here are some further resources, which can also be insightful. Some of you may have already visited this many a times. It's our HSFC website. HFEA, so that's the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. They are the government regulator. Oops, sorry, one second. <laughs> they are the government regulator to make sure all UK fertility clinics comply with the law. Again, their website is very informative. Then we have BICA, which is the British Inter In Infertility Counseling Association. Um, all of our counsellors are from BICA, so they're all members of BICA, and it's the only one that's recognised by the HFEA. This can be a very important part of your treatment, as Darshi mentioned earlier. Then we have the National Gamete Donation Trust and Donor Con Conception Network. These are charity organisations that support clinics and families of children conceived um, with donors, and even those that are thinking about it. Georgia, can I have the next slide, please? IUI is a great treatment option uh, for couples and single women and for many reasons that you will have heard today already. Treatment using donor sperm is such a great opportunity and almost like a gift, uh, you know, that allows single women, same sex couples or couples with azuspermia to have children. So to start your journey with us, we can help to arrange a consultation and any initial tests that might be needed. All you would need to do is to give us a call or email us to get in touch and we can get this booked in for you. We do consultations at varied times to try and offer, you know, flexible appointments throughout the week. Next, we have a short video of the journey of uh, one of our patients, Ailey. Basically, we were, we must have been trying for about, I don't know, five years or something for Francis. And we did lots and lots of IVF, which didn't work. Um, and then we ended up going down a more natural route. So we had to kind of change the whole tact, really. We'd 
I'd got to the point where I just felt that the IVF just wasn't going to work. Okay. Um, and, you know, after each failure, it's, it's really, really hard to kind of pick yourself back up and, and try again. But I was just so determined um, to, you know, for it to work. I just, I couldn't let myself completely give up hope, although you do feel very much like that <laughs> immediately after. It's so it hasn't worked, and I actually, I, to give myself another focus while I, while I was going through all this, I started a, I started a part time degree. <laughs> it felt like you know even so even when the the IVF wasn't working, I, there was something else that was within my control that 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 was. Yes. Um. So yeah, I find that massively helpful at helping me to kind of get through, get through it. Um. And then when we had Francis, we were. Obviously, absolutely over the moon, and that he actually he actually came on just our second try of IUI after having had ten failures of IVF. Okay. With Francis, it was really just like the miracle baby of mm-hmm. whether actually the IUI might work again. So I came at it with a kind of not great hope or expectations. Just just had to try and see whether or not it would work and. It was going to be the icing on the cake, I suppose, because at least you know at least we had Francis. And then with with Rose, we tried. We had about I think on our fourth try of IUI, we had a pregnancy, and unfortunately we then lost it. At twi- uh, we found out at the twelve week span. Okay. Um, and then two more tries later, and we had Rose. Did at- you do a degree this time as well? <laughs> uh, well, kind of. I, my, the degree that I did um, led me into doing a PhD and changing my oh, career. Oh, really? So I'm, I'm doing a PhD at the moment. Yeah. What subject? Are you um, it's, it's environmental science, so I'm, oh. I'm studying the environmental benefits of um, planting trees, basically, for climate change mitigation. You know, when you really want it, it's just so important to try and stay, to try and pick yourself up and work hard at trying to stay positive because it's really easy to let it get you down. And yeah. it's, and actually, I'm, you know, you, you play mind games on yourself, but I feel like if you can stay positive and you can kind of keep a feeling of kind of love <laughs> inside your, then actually it, it helps with the process and it helps your body, I think. And yeah. be more open to conceiving, but it's freaking hard. But um... I started my treatment in a different clinic um, for a, a short period of time, and it was just—it was a really bad experience. They, they didn't seem to have any a kind of individual. You weren't an individual. It just felt like you were a number. Mm-hmm. And when when I came to Harley Street, they really treated you like an individual and they treat you like an an intelligent person as well they don't just you know they tell you what's going on and they'll and Dr Venkat was was always really kind of open and has time for you and all the nurses are are, you know they're fantastic they really seem to care Mm -hmm. and it just makes such a big difference it really does our family our family what you would advise other women who go through the same, who lose hope? You know, it's easy. It's easy to, you know, to hear all the the, the negative stories, but you know, because pe- these people are googling things nonstop, <laughs> mm-hmm. trying to find out other people's experience. And I suppose just like my case has got to be <laughs> one of the worst. You know, I went through ten IVF, <sighs> and there was there, there was nothing wrong with me. And we were using healthy, we, we ended up using donor sperm, so we were using healthy sperm. So there was nothing wrong with me, and we were using healthy sperm, but it just wouldn't work. And I think it was just the stress, the stress of it all, and my body was too sensitive. It just got, it just didn't want to accept the embryos. Mm. Um, and so actually changing our tactics to going down a much more natural route, mm. where, where I ended up taking no hormones, no drugs, no nothing, it was just a a very straightforward uh, UI that 
that worked for me. So I think, you know, just just keep the faith, and you just need you just need to kind of believe that it will work. And and you know, when people really know that they've come to the end of the line, they'll know. But if you want, really still want it and you're not ready to give up, do everything you can to make sure your body is 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 healthy and and um, feeling as best as it can before you try or when you try. It's, it, it's just it's just really hard but you know that it, it can happen for and if I you know I could easily have given up after five IVFs or to even ten IVFs but I you know I I didn't and um, it's it's the, the best <laughs> the best decision you know I could have made Okay, that was a very inspiring video, I have to say. I have to um, thank Delia, for, who's our um, marketing manager, for putting that together. It's a very heartfelt video, and it's always nice to hear from the patient directly. So thank you, Delia. So now we turn to some questions. Um, we've got a few already, and if you'd like to ask a question, please pop it into the questions box on your panel, and um, we will field them and try and answer them to the best of our ability. So the first question that I have is, says, uh, medic, medical IUI, presume, uh, potentially medicated IUI process increases the risk of multiple pregnancy. Is it possible with a bicornuate or arcuate uterus? Um, since this is a clinical question, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Benkert, um, please, to answer. Uh, hi. So it's a good question uh, because bicornuate uterus means there are two horns of uterus. Maybe I just put it in very simple terms. The uterus is divided into two halves. They are instead of two, uh, instead of one chamber, the uterus has two chambers, and uh, the risk of miscarriage is higher with this because of the uh, small compartments, and that's why we have to be careful. Yes. So if we give um actually the medications like letazar or promifin sometimes women can produce two follicles leading to ovulation from the ball follicles with the two eggs and if both are fertilized and you can have twins but with ioi one thing we can't control is if both the embryo that is if both the eggs are fertilized and then implanted in one half of the uterus, then the risk of miscarriage will be high because how one half of the uterus will not be capable of holding two babies. But if you have one baby in each horn, then the, you can continue the pregnancy. But this cannot be controlled in IUI, uh, but we have seen such a thing happening with the IVF because then we usually transfer one embryo in such women because we don't want to risk a multiple pregnancy and miscarriage. But if in case she has had a few attempts and uh, her embryos are not great uh, quality, we want to transfer two embryos. But we have that ability to transfer one embryo into each horn. Therefore, if the embryo implants, the, it implants in a separate chamber. That is better because then the babies grow in two different halves and the risk of miscarriage may be reduced compared to when you have two babies in one chamber. That is the difference. So in IUI, we cannot control this. That is the difficulty we will face in IUI. So if someone has got bicornuate uterus to reduce the risk of miscarriage, it's better to have one follicle, monofollicular induction. And that is natural cycle. Or if there are, there are somebody has uh, polycystic ovaries in addition, they are not ovulating, we will give a low dose, like a half a tablet of Clomid. And letrozole is comparatively better uh, than Clomid because it induces monofollicular induction. That is, it makes you produce only one egg. 
So we can use, we prefer to use letrozole under these circumstances to avoid the risk of multiple pregnancy. Thank you very much for that informative answer. The next question is, how long does it typically take to access the sperm and start treatment from a choice of sperm then? Uh, so this is, in terms of starting treatment, we usually recommend that women go through a checkup first, um, and that checkup process um, takes, it's only one visit to the clinic, but it needs to be done at the right time in your cycle. Um, and then we you know, discuss the results with you and plan out your treatment. And then you would typically look to start treatment with another uh, menstrual cycle. And the IUI treatment, as Dr. Benkat mentioned earlier, is performed around the time of ovulation. And during that time, you know, from the start of the cycle to the insemination time, we will monitor you a couple of times with ultrasound scan. So really the treatment can begin with essentially your next cycle. Um, but if you're importing sperm from further afield, um, it may take a little bit longer, depending on whether we have an agreement with the donor bank already. And with the current climate, it is taking a little while to import samples from abroad. Um, previously, it would take a week or two, um, but now it may take a little while longer. And we always want to make sure that the sperm is on site at the clinic before we start your treatment to avoid any unnecessary issues. Um, if I if I missed anything on that, Dr. Venkat? No, I wanted to say that if you want to expedite everything, choose the uh, sperm from the clinic because you don't have to move it anywhere from anywhere. And it is there, you start the treatment straight away. If you have to bring it from outside, we must remember it takes about three weeks at least for the paperwork and really bringing the sperm physically to the, especially from overseas or even from London sperm bar, which is not very far from our clinic, but paperwork and the transport of the uh, sperm takes two to three weeks. Therefore, you must start preparing well. Preparation is very important. And if you want to uh, avoid, we, you can choose the sperm from our clinic. And I would like to add there, we got one, one or two uh, white sperm, both of them have proven fertility. And one Asian sperm, he has got proven fertility. And we have now a uh, mixed race donor coming to this uh, bank. Um, so once it is released, hopefully that will also be a good sperm. Like Suri said, I always say, don't look for blue eyes and blonde hair and all these things. If you don't have a baby at the end, what is the use of blue eye and blonde hair? You need to have a healthy baby. Choose a donor who has got proven fertility and give yourself a lot of time to bring the sperm into the clinic before starting the treatment. Otherwise, it gives you and the staff a lot of stress in the end because you don't want additional strength. We want you to be happy during your journey of the treatment. Thank you, Sudhir. Thank you. The next question is, is, on average, how long is the process from first consultation to a successful outcome? It's um, similar to the previous one, but unfortunately that is like asking how long a piece of string is, because as you saw from Ailey's story there, it, you know, from initial consultation to the first treatment can be essentially as little as two cycles, but in, in some cases the journey can be quite long. Um, so that's where I'd like to leave that one. In um, some cases, it can be short as well. Yeah, so it just varies, unfortunately. Um, donor sperm seems to come in different motility options. Is it okay to choose the lower ones? I think, so searching around, I think this is donor sperm that you're looking at from the London Sperm Bank, who sort of, they classify their sperm slightly differently to say they give you different motility options. When you're looking at IUI, you really want the best quality sperm that is available. Um, so, you know, the highest possible motility that you can get because it's quite close. You know, we're putting the sperm a bit closer. We're placing it inside the uterus so it doesn't have to make the whole journey, but it's almost similar to a natural conception in that the sperm needs to travel up the fallopian tube to meet the egg and fertilize the egg. Um, and it's not like IVF where the two are sitting next to each other in a Petri dish. So we'd always recommend to choose a higher motility option. 
One last question. What do I do if it is out of stock? You know, sometimes donor banks do run out of um, vials online, or particularly when you're looking for sibling sperm, this can happen. Um, we always recommend that you contact the donor bank personally. You know, sometimes websites aren't always fully up to date, and banks will often hold a few vials in reserve that they don't put on their website for these purposes of sibling sperm. And, you know, if you speak to them, they may have some left over, but in some rare cases, they may also contact the donor again if you're looking for sibling sperm and ask them to donate once more. Um, so that is a possibility as well, and we've seen that happen. I don't think there are any other questions that have come through at the moment. We'll give it one more minute. Oh, sorry, I did miss one, actually, which says, what is the process and cost for using a known donor for IUI? Um, so uh, in terms of using a known donor, we would do a full sort of workup for that donor. So they would go through consultation and counselling and then screening um, before actually freezing some samples of sperm. And then the frozen sperm has to be quarantined because we will then rescreen the donor a few months later to check for any latent infections. And then this, once the second round of screening has been done and he's clear, um, the sperm is released for use. So the process can take uh, somewhere, I mean, the shortest time you can absolutely do it in would probably be about four months, um, but you'll realistically, it will take about six months to get someone cleared from start to finish. Um, and the costs of it are, I think these days, the price of an ampule of donor sperm is about 1,000 pounds, give or take. Um, and we say to uh, order about two ampules. And I th if I remember correctly, the cost of using a known donor is similar. It costs about 2,000 pounds to get through the whole process from start to finish. But bear in mind, you can always freeze a lot more ampules when you're using a known donor just for yourself, as opposed to purchasing it per ampule from a donor bank. That's all the questions that we have. So thank you very much. Thank you all for listening and attending this evening's webinar. Uh, I would like to thank this evening's panel. So thank you, Dr. Venkat. Thank you, Darshi. And thank you, Bijal. Um, and last but not least, I would like to thank our technical moderators. Um, so Georgia, thank you very much uh, for putting this together and helping us on the technical side. Thank you all and have a lovely evening and a wonderful weekend. Good night.